when is receiver not really a receiver? When is a running back not really a running back? What do these positions mean? Do they mean anything at all? Is there even any a po- is there even a point to have any kind of distinctions like running back, receiver, tight end, pass catcher, whatever it may be? Apparently not. It doesn't matter anymore. Positions don't count, and that's a okay because now Desmond Reed, the pit running back is the ACC Receiver of the Week. Reed was one of three Pitt players to earn weekly honors from the conference. Announced yesterday, and another one, well, it was a guy who was just on screen a second ago there, Eli Holstein claimed the Eli Holstein Honorary ACC Rookie of the Week Award, an award that certainly will be named after Holstein after a couple more weeks when he sets the record for ACC Rookie of the Week honors in a season. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. There aren't many guys who've won ACC Rookie of the Week as many times as Eli Holstein, and he's only played five games. There's more to come. And there's more to come for all these guys. we got a lot to talk about here on the Tuesday edition of the Morning Pit. We're going to talk about those ACC individual awards. We're going to talk about some other things that really stand out to me about this team. A key stat that I think is really interesting. We'll write more about today and and uh, probably throughout the week. It's, probably, it's one of these things that I'm just going to get sort of stuck on. You know how my brain gets stuck on a stat? Uh, you know, like last week, I think I was talking a lot about third downs and third down success. Well, Pitt went out offensively and had one of its best had its best game of the season on third down and North Carolina on Saturday. Now we've got something that they're doing well. We're going to talk about here today, a stat that uh, Pitt is doing well on both sides of the ball. And um, we'll see if that has any impact on the game on Saturday. I'm guessing it won't, but it's going to be relevant and something to keep an eye on as we get uh, closer to Saturday afternoon and uh, that game against Cal at Acroshore Stadium. So let's talk about the ACC Players of the Week. Let's talk about what Eli Holstein and Desmond Reed and Kyle Lewis have been doing. And then let's talk about a key stat for this team that's really helped the Panthers get to the success, uh, you know, get to the level they, they're at and uh, enjoy the success they've been enjoying all right here on the Tuesday edition of the morning pit on youtube.com slash pantalaircom yeah when you go five and oh you know when you keep winning football games you keep having success you tend to show up on the ACC weekly honor roll pretty often and that's been the case for Pitt so far this season the Panthers a regular uh participant a regular uh honoree um Pretty much, I think, every week of the season, I, I should uh, – well, yeah, I mean, obviously every week of the season because Eli Holstein has won ACC Rookie of the Week every week. And so Pitt has had somebody get some recognition pretty much every week um, throughout the season. Maybe they didn't get anybody after the Kent State game other than Holstein. But after the Cincinnati game, Kanate Mumfield got receiver of the week and uh, Desmond Reed was running back of the week. After the West Virginia game, I think Donovan McMillan was uh, defensive back of the week. Oh, Ben Sauls was kicker of the week after the uh, Cincinnati game as well. Um, Holstein was quarterback of the week after the West Virginia game. Um, After the Youngstown State game, it might have just been Holstein as rookie of the week. Oh, Kyle Lewis was linebacker of the week after the West Virginia game as well. Um, And then Holstein was rookie of the week after the Youngstown State game. And then this past week, or announced yesterday three more honorees Kyle Lewis got his second linebacker of the week Holstein got another rookie of the week and Desmond Reed Pitts running back was named wide receiver of the week but you catch 11 passes for 155 yards and a touchdown that's probably going to go to you somebody else uh, another running back I forget his name uh, I forget who it was had four rushing touchdowns or, or four total touchdowns, two rushing and two receiving over the weekend. And so he got running back of the week. It's understandable. They still got Desmond Reed some recognition as receiver of the week. Listen, here's here's the thing with Desmond Reed. I'm going to talk about Eli Holstein in a second. But here's the thing with Desmond Reed. Like, there was a question yesterday during Pat Narduzzi's press conference. I think it was our good friend Will Graves from the Associated Press. You know, says, um, you know, when you when you look at Desmond Reed, like, how did he slip past? How did 130 FBS teams look at him and say, and every one of them said, no, he can't play for us? Like, how is that possible? You know, when, when he goes and then has, you know, obviously has a great success, great career at Western Carolina, comes to Pitt and is having a great career here. But coming out of high school, how did everyone look at Desmond Reed and say, no, he he's not good enough? And I get it. I understand that question. But I, I got to be honest, when it comes to Desmond Reed, like I'm past the point of qualifiers. I'm past the point of saying, you know, well, 
a guy for a guy his size or you know for a guy from the FCS ranks like no he's not really good for a guy his size he's not really good for a guy from the FCS ranks he's just really good you know he's not like you know uh, you know obviously his size no no more about his size yeah he's small and he's also one of the best players in the country right now i mean literally he's second in the con- in the country the entire country second in all purpose yards per game and he's only got like 78 return yards you know what i mean there was that long punt return touchdown against kent state and that that's pretty much it everything else has been you know receiving and rushing so he's not even just adding in a bunch of yards you know quadri henderson was like you know all-american all-purpose guy and he had all those long kick returns and punt returns that's not what desmond reed is doing he's getting his yards in the offense running the ball catching the ball and he's one of the best players in the country right now one of the most dynamic playmakers in the country, not regardless of size, not regardless of coming from an FCS team. None of those things apply. None of those things are relevant. All right, we're five games into this season, six weeks, seven weeks into the college football season. Desmond Reed is one of the best players on this team, one of the best players in the conference, and one of the best players in the country. And it doesn't matter anymore how big he is, and it doesn't matter where he came from unless you want to use it as inspiration for short guys playing at FCS schools, And in which case, great. You know, he should be an inspiration to those guys to keep fight, fighting and keep battling. You know, and it should be a, a, you know, a, um, a cautionary tale about how the separation in talent's not as great as we thought between the FCS and FBS or uh, all that other nonsense. Like, I'm, I'm done with that. I, I'm past that point. It doesn't matter. It's like... Um, it was either in a mailbag question or in the post game show, or at somebody at some point asked me about, you know, how they're going to keep you know, Eli Holstein and Cade Bell. Like, I'm not thinking about that. I'm not thinking about where Desmond Reed was last year, and I'm not thinking about where Eli Holstein and Cade Bell are going to be next year. None of that is relevant. What's relevant is right now, Pitt has one of the best offenses in the country by all stats. Except for rushing. I think they're 50th in the country in rushing yards per game, and that's still averaging more than 180 yards per game. And they're like top 12, top 15 in yards per carry. So even there, we can make a case they they have a pretty effective rushing attack, buoyed by Eli Holsey, but nonetheless, one of the best offenses in the country, which is a credit to Cade Bell, one of the top producing quarterbacks in the country, which is a credit to Eli Holstein, and one of the most dynamic all-around players in college football, which is a credit to Desmond Reed. Like that's what's happening right now. That's why this team is five and O is on the strength of those guys performances. And that's, that's what's relevant to me. I'm not thinking about Desmond Reed's size anymore. You know, I like, I'm, I'm not, I'm not thinking about the fact that he came from the FC, FCS anymore. And I'm not thinking about where any of this, you know, like any of those other things, they don't matter anymore. What matters is he's one of the best. And it really is. And I think you can find a lot to, to back that up in the conference and in the country. He gets ACC Receiver of the Week honors this week just to further make the point. Eli Holstein, of course, named ACC Cor- uh, Rookie of the Week, I should say Rookie of the Week, for the fifth time this season. And you might recall a week or two ago, we went over some of the history of um, – players who've won the ACC Rookie of the Week multiple times, as many times as Eli Holstein is. He's now won it five times in as many games, right? He's played five games. He's been ACC Rookie of the Week five times. If you go back to the expansion of the ACC in 2013, there have been five players prior to Holstein who were named ACC Rookie of the Week at least five times in a season. Jameis Winston in 2013, Trevor Lawrence in 2018, Sam Howell in 2019, Tyler Van Dyke in 2021, and Drake May in 2022. All very good players, obviously. All very good quarterbacks, obviously. All guys who had great seasons those years, and their teams were among the best in the conference in those years. Out of those five guys, Lawrence, Van Dyke, and May were named ACC Rookie of the Week just five times each. Howell, Sam Howell in 2019, Jameis Winston in 2013 were named ACC Rookie of the Week six times each in their seasons. Now, I I stopped looking this up at 2013. I didn't feel like going back any. Oh, I did. I went back to like 2011 or so, and it got harder to find the stats. 2012, Duke Johnson, the running back from Miami, was named ACC Rookie of the Week five times. Um, but I don't have any indication. Or reason to believe that someone was ever named ACC Rookie of the Week more than six times. 
Eli Holstein's got five in five games. He's probably going to break that record. And his stats, I mean, the, the, the stats are remarkable. I mean, they're some of the best ever put up by a pick quarterback. You know, certainly through the five games, and if you take and project that out to what it could be over 12 games, it's one of the best statistical seasons in Pitt history. This is the kind of territory we're in now. All right, as you approach the midpoint of the season, that's what Saturday's game against Cal is going to be. You're talking about some guys who are on pace to put up some of the biggest, most impressive, most productive seasons in Pitt history. And obviously these guys, Eli Holstein, Desmond Reed, Kyle Lewis, they're, they're driving the ship You know that, that's leading this team to the success they've had. Yesterday we did our top five player rankings where uh, everybody on the message boards at pantheware.com puts their, their top five for the season, who, who they think have been the five best players so far. Uh, I finally did it. I broke down and put Eli Holstein at number one. I've been, I've been holding on to Kyle, Kyle Lewis. I had Kyle Lewis at number one for the longest time. I wanted to hold off on moving the quarterback up there. And, and and it's not like Kyle Lewis did anything wrong. Again, he was ACC linebacker of the week. But I just couldn't hold off any longer. You look at the stats. You look at the production. You look at what he has done for this team. Eli Holstein is the best player on the team. Uh, I think I still had Kyle Lewis at number two, Desmond Reed at number three, and I think the separation among those three is not very uh, severe. I, I mean, it's it's pretty slim, you know, and, and you could make a pretty good case for any one of those three being number one, number two, and number three in any order you like, and you're not going to get a lot of disagreement or argument from me because, yeah, they're all playing at a really high level. And then you can decide for yourself what you have at four and five, I have Rasheem Biles and Ben Sauls. Ben Sauls, one of, I think uh, – 11 kickers in the country who who are perfect right now. I, I just had this stat. I just tweeted this stat out yesterday. How do I not have it um, right in front of me? It's pretty... Uh, I'm sorry. There are 14 kickers in FBS who are perfect on field goals this season. Only three of them have attempted and made more field goals than Ben Sauls. Sauls is nine of nine through five games. He's perfect. And uh, you can make a case he's one of the top five kickers in the country, maybe, maybe higher. Uh, you know, so I, I have to give him a little love and put him in the top five player rankings, but either way, Holstein, Reed Lewis, these guys are really, really good and playing at a really, really high level. Now, the other thing Pitt is doing, and I might end up talking about this. I don't know a couple times this week. Cause this, this is the stat that I'm going to get my brain stuck on and I'm not going to be able to get around. I'm probably going to write about it in the three, two, one column on Friday. I'm going to talk to Jim Hammond on a Jim Hammett about it on the uh, live stream tomorrow night. Uh, and every time it becomes relevant during the game on Saturday, I'm sure I'm going to be tweeting about it and everything like that. But after talking about individual players, there there's something else Pitt is doing from a team perspective on both sides of the ball that has had a whole lot to do with their success this season. And it's red zone play in the red zone where Pitt is literally one of the best all around teams, offense, defense in the red zone in the country. As a matter of fact, if you look, okay. So the first thing I I have to say, and and this is always important to point out, I've, I've been on this for a long time. If you go to the NCAA's official stat website and you search red zone, either offense or defense, they're going to have a ranking and it's going to have a percentage and teams will be ranked according to their percentage. How often do they score in the red zone for your offensive ranking? How often do they, you know, do opponents score in the red zone for your defensive ranking? It's all well and good. And that's what always gets referenced. They've got the number one red zone offense in the country. But the problem of course, is the NCAA is just looking at how many red zone attempts you have and how many times you score well the scores incorporate touchdowns and field goals now you and i don't have to be bill Bill belichick and bill parcells to know that a touchdown is not equal to a field goal and so equating them as such and saying wow you're you're really good you scored on 90 percent of your red zone drives you know if you get into the red zone 100 times and you score 90 field goals that's not all that good even though you're 90 percent right? You, you kind of failed. And, and I think settling for a field goal when you get into the red zone is a bit of a failure on the off part of the offense. And likewise, getting a field goal, forcing a field goal when the opponent drives into the red zone is a bit of a success for the defense. So I never really liked how the NCAA does that. So I've had to take it into my own hands. And I, and I think what the, the key stats to look at the things that are most relevant and most, uh, telling 
because I've, I've I've always looked at it like, okay, I don't like the NCAA's way because I don't want to equate field goals with touchdowns, but how can I make it make more sense? And, and there's two stats that I think are both, rel- I'm not sure if one means more than the other. Uh, I, I, well, one might be a little bit more important than the other, but there's two stats really uh, that you can sort of calculate and I've taken the liberty of doing so. Uh, there's points per red zone perception, points per red zone possession so if you take all the drives in you calculate all the touchdowns give them six points for each touchdown three points for each field goal you know add it all together divided by the number of red zone possessions you get points per red zone possession and that's an offensive stat and a defensive stat obviously the higher the better on offense the lower the better on defense and then there's the other one that i that i've uh always sort of looked at is touchdown percentage what percentage of your red zone drives end in touchdowns High percentage is what you want for offense. Low percentage is what you want for defense. So I went through and calculated all this stuff. Spreadsheets are awesome. Google Sheets, you know, you're, you're magical for your formulas and, and copy and pasting all those things. And I looked at the top 25 schools in those four stat categories. Red zone points per possession, offense and defense. Red zone touchdown percentage, offense and defense. Okay. Top 25 schools in those four categories. There are... Six schools, six, in the nation, okay, that rank in the top 25 in all four of those categories. Six schools that are in the top 25 in red zone points per possession offense, red zone points per possession defense, red zone touchdown percentage offense, red zone touchdown percentage defense. Six schools in the whole country rank in the top 25. Like, these are literally the best all-around schools in the red zone like Ole Miss is probably the best defensive red zone team in the country they are number one in the country in points per red zone possession allowed and they're number two in the country in red zone touchdown percentage allowed like one of the best Boston College is really good they're seventh in points per possession uh allowed you know points per possession defense they're third in touchdown percentage but neither one of those teams is very good offensively um Ohio State you know, number two red zone points per possession offense in the country. Number two touchdown percentage offense in the country. But their defense doesn't crack the top 25. They get like barely inside the top 25 in points per possession, uh, but they're outside the top 25 in touchdown percentage. So only six teams are, are have this sort of balanced ability to make plays in the red zone. And I mean, you can already guess that Pitt's one of the six. Uh, the other five... Army, Navy, Texas, Penn State, and Notre Dame. And then Pitt. Now, if you know your college football, if you're up on everybody's rankings and scores and and records and whatnot, you know those six teams, Army, Navy, Texas, Penn State, Notre Dame, and Pitt, have a combined record of 29-1. and That's not a coincidence. Like, as much as the game changes, as much as analytics change, as much as, and, and there's some element of analytics here going for touchdowns when you're in the red zone as opposed to settling for field goals, but as much as things change, it's still there are still some basic elements of football that are relevant in, in college, the college game and the pro game. You know, third downs are still relevant and it's very significant. Red zone scoring. Like, if you can get the ball that close to the end zone, get it inside 20 yards, you need to be able to come away with touchdowns. And it's not a coincidence that these six teams that all rank inside the top 25 in offense and defense red zone success are 5-0, 5-0, 5-0, 5-0, 5-0, and 4-1. It's not a coincidence. Yeah, I mean, it's not. And this Pitt team is really good. Now, those six teams I talked about, I mean, Pitt generally is the, the lowest ranked out of those six, but they're inside the top 20 um, in points per red zone possession, offense and defense. They're they're 19 in both of those categories. They're number 20 in offensive touchdown percentage in the red zone, and they're number 21 in defensive touchdown percentage in the red zone. Navy's probably the best overall. They're you know, number one offense in the red zone. They've scored a touchdown. Navy has scored a touchdown every time they get into the red zone. You want to know why Navy's, you know, five and zero right now? Because they've gone into the red zone 18 times and they've scored 18 touchdowns. 
It's pretty simple. Army's not far behind. They've gone into the red zone 20 times. They've scored 18 touchdowns and one field goal. So they have 19 scores on 20 possessions. More relevantly, they have 18 touchdowns on 20 possessions. You know, and, and it, it goes from there. Texas, uh, Texas is really good. Top five in both offensive red zone categories. Top two in both defensive red zone categories. I mean, te- Texas is a hard team to stop when they get inside the red zone. And they're a hard team to score on when you get inside the red zone. Penn State, Notre Dame find themselves more in the teens with most of these stat categories, offense and defense, and pitch right behind them, kind of right there at that that cutoff of the 20 mark, the top 20, top 25. But I think this is important. You know, I I, I really do. And, and I think it's something you even saw in the North Carolina game, you know, particularly on defense, where, you know, they have those two fourth down stops in the red zone. Uh, they had uh, another, no, they had the two fourth down stops in the red zone. They had, uh, in the first half, they stopped uh, Carolina for a field goal. They did give up um, two touchdowns from the red zone, and, and that's going to happen. They've given up seven red zone touchdowns all season, but they were able to step up and make plays, and they've been able to step up and make plays. And just like we talk about, you know, we talk about third down success, we talk about pit success on fourth down, this kind of situational thing, playing in the red zone, is huge. And both sides of the ball, Pitt's offense and defense, have been effective in that area. And I think it's a big part of why they've been so successful this season. So keep an eye on that. See what happens on Saturday when they get in the red zone. If Pitt's able to keep up its success on both ends of the field, uh, you know, when they get into the red zone or when Cal gets into the red zone, that's going to be it's going to be big. Now, of course, if you just give up long touchdowns, and Pitt certainly has given up plenty of those, then um, you know it's not. It's not quite as, uh, it, it doesn't, it, it rings a little more, it rings a little hollow, you know, like, uh, oh, great, you didn't give up any red zone touchdowns. You just gave up a bunch of 40-yard touchdowns. So that's not quite as good. But I think you get my point. They've been really good in the uh, red zone. One of the best teams in the country, both offense and defense. All right, we have lots more uh, Pit Cal preview content for you over the course of the week. Really looking forward to it. We'll hear from Pit players and coaches today and tomorrow. We'll talk about all of that right here on the Morning Pit. And of course, we have our live show tomorrow night at 8.30 p.m. right here on youtube.com slash pentaglaircom. Make sure you like this video and subscribe so you don't miss the Morning Pit, you don't miss the live show on Wednesday night, and you don't miss our post-game show on Saturday after Pit Cal. We will be live right here at youtube.com slash pentaglaircom. So make sure you tune in for that. Those uh, conversations are always a lot of fun. So we hope you can join us and uh, that'll be a good time. All right. Um, that does it here. Like this video and subscribe youtube.com slash pantheraircom. So you don't miss any of our pit video content. Check out the website, panther-lair.com, pittsburgh.rivals.com to get all your pit sports news. And that's it. Thanks so much for your time today. Hope you have a great Tuesday and we'll catch up with you tomorrow for the morning pit right here on youtube.com slash pantheraircom.